And I'm going to start today to share through the book of 1 Samuel. The Bible tells us that all the things that have been written in the Word of God are written for our learning. And so we'll find in these stories of real people's lives things that will help us grow in the Lord. And so Today we're going to talk about a woman whose name is Hannah and how God dealt with her. I think it, in some ways it goes along with some of the things that were said today in that she was a woman who really had some problems in terms of a rivalry and it was affecting her very deeply in her heart. How did she deal with it? What did she do? And so we're going to talk about that today. But the overall gist of this message is that all things work together for good. How many of you believe that? That God is able to make all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that everything we experience on a given day is good, but somehow in His divine ability, in His sovereignty, God is able to take all the circumstances of our life and somehow work them for good. And I, I would bet if we were to sit down and talk to people here and you would tell them the story of their life or the, the story of different events they've gone through, you would hear over and over and over again the testimony is true that God is able to take anything in our life and work it for good. And so if you're here today and you're not in a good spot or you're in a discouraged place, know this, that God, God will take it and do something beautiful with it. And this is the story of Hannah. So let's pray this morning. Father, I ask you right now to cause your Holy Spirit to teach us, Lord. You are the teacher. And your word reveals to us the heart of God. I pray this morning as we look into this this book of the Old Testament, that you would reveal the heart of Jesus to us. Lord, it would cause us to want to love you more. But most importantly, it would stir our faith that regardless of what condition we are in currently today, we would know that we can always come to you and call upon you in our most dire of circumstances. I ask you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you'll turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now you need to know that before Samuel was born, Israel was in a very, I'll call it a very bad spiritual climate. I mean, when we read through the book, you'll see in weeks to come that the priests who were there had no regard for the Lord. I mean, they were desecrating the sacrifices of God. It even says they didn't even know the Lord. Can you imagine that, that the priests who were there to serve the Lord and represent the people didn't even know Him? It also talks about how in those days the word of the Lord was very rare. It was very rare for God to speak to those people. It was very rare, even more so, for them to hear what God was saying. And it actually closes up in the book of Judges which historically happened just before this. And one of the scriptures in the end of the book of Judges says, it's in verse 25, Numbers 21, or Judges 21, 25, that in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. That sounds kind of like our world, doesn't it? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes is how the King James Version puts it. So there was just kind of like anarchy no one was really focused in the sense on what does God want us to do? They were just doing their own thing. And the history of the book of Judges uh, was, was kind of like a roller coaster. If you've ever read that story, it's kind of Israel was doing badly. They would call upon the Lord. He would send a judge who would deliver them. They would do well and they would praise him. Then they would fall away again and fall into uh, a, a downward slide spiritually. They would call upon the Lord. He'd send another judge. And they would do well for a while, and then backslide again, and then do well and backslide. And the whole book of Judges is like that until it comes to the book of Samuel. And Samuel was like the last of the judges, 
but he was also the prophet who ordained the first king, Saul, as well as David. So Samuel was kind of in a transition period as Israel was moving from leadership by the judges to leadership by a king. But in that time, it was a very, very depressed spiritual condition. So you keep that in mind as we start this. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. How many of you know that is a problem? <laughs> so we're setting off at the very beginning. We have a problem here. All right? He had two wives. Most of you guys that are married know that one is sufficient. Amen? (laughs) But he had two. And wives, I don't mean that in a bad way. Us husbands can't handle more than that. It's really us. So he had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other, Penina. Penina had children. But Hannah had none. How many know that's problem number two? One had children. The other had no children. So this is the family we're talking about here. Whenever the day came, or I'm sorry, year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. So there was a yearly sacrifice, and every time that anniversary came, Elkanah would gather his two wives, Hannah and Penina, and all of Penina's children, and they would go up to Shiloh, which was the town where the presence of God was at that time, and they would come and they would worship there. He was a, he was a man who was trying to follow after the Lord. He was, if you want to call it, a religious man, trying to follow the ways of the Lord. And so year after year, so when you read this story today, and you start seeing the condition that Hannah was in, I want you to know that this lasted a long time. When you say year after year, it's not like week after week or month after month. We're talking year after year. So year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came... For Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he gave a double portion. How many know that's a problem? To Hannah, he gave a double portion. That means twice as much because he loved her. What do you think that caused in the heart of Penina? Sure. I mean, you can see that even though this Elkanah was a man who loved God, he wasn't really using good judgment in terms of his family life. You know, why did he have two wives? Maybe he married Hannah first and she could have no children, so he found another who would give children. But regardless, there were problems being developed within this family, conflict that wasn't being resolved. And it would happen year after year. To Hannah, he gave a double portion because her, he loved her, and listen to this, and the Lord had closed her womb. Who closed that womb? See, it was the Lord. The Lord closed her womb. And the closing of that womb was one of the biggest problems in that family. Because Hannah, like all of the women of Israel at that time, wanted to have children. For them, not to have children was a sense um, that the blessing of God was not upon their life. These women wanted to be able to carry on the namesake of their family. They wanted to have children so the next generation could come and the name of the family could pass on. They wanted to have children that maybe they would be the ones who would bring Messiah to the world. So there was a, just kind of a built-in desire among these women to have children and to be barren like Hannah was, 
was looked at as almost like a curse. And here she was. She carried around every day of her life this stigma of, I have no children. But you need to know that it was God who put this condition in place. You would think, well, man, Lord, all you got to do is one little thing. Give her a baby and it will solve the problem. Give her a baby and now Hannah and Penina won't be arguing and fighting. Just give her a baby and she'll be satisfied. Give her a baby and they'll stop their picking and the jealousy and the rivalry will be gone. It was a simple thing, but yet the Lord said, I'm holding back on this baby. In a sense, you could say that the Lord brought this affliction. Now, you might hear teaching today that the Lord never wants his people to suffer, but I I don't really see that that's held true throughout the Scripture. There's people who suffer, people of God, a lot in the Bible. And in this particular case, it says it was the Lord who closed her womb. Verse 6, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, what does he call the other wife? A rival. They're a rival because they each want the attention. They each want to be the favorite. They each want to be best. I'm better than you because I have all these children and you have none. Well, I'm better than you because I get twice as much food when we go to the sacrifice. And there's a rivalry that was developing here. The Lord had closed Hannah's womb. Her rival kept provoking her. What does that sound like to you? It's like constantly digging, picking. Irritation is what it calls it here. This this word irritate in the Hebrew language means that she was just, uh, to to put it in, in today's vernacular, hopping mad. She was just mad, frustrated. It just, this provoking that came into her life from this rival irritated her to no end. Verse 7, this went on year after year. When does it get to be old enough? When is it, Lord, when are you going to have some mercy here and just give her a baby? Solve this problem. Why is it that she has to suffer year after year? Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept. You ever had that happen in your life? Somebody provokes you until, they, until you just can't do anything but start crying. This is happening to this woman. Provoked her, picked, jabbed at her until she wept. And she would not eat. Have you ever been in that desperate place where you're so irritated, so angry, so frustrated by this relationship, I can't even eat. I can't even think straight. Well, this is Hannah. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Insensitive husband here. How many of you wives know that when you are in a position of irritation, normally your husband is not the best person to come and be talking to you? (laughs) So this is what's happening here. Hannah, why are you weeping? Shouldn't it be obvious to him why she's weeping? I mean, this is a question that doesn't have to be asked, is it? Why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? How many of you know that was not... That was not the thing to say to a woman who wants to have a baby. All I want is to have a baby. And no, you're not better than ten babies. <laughs> oh, it was a bad question. But I'm, I'm setting up the situation here. So three problems in this family. One is he had two wives. Two, he gave the double portion to, Penina, or to Hannah. And three, God closed her womb and the rival provoked her. It's a sad situation. Now I want to talk about the nature of Hannah's affliction. We just talked about it, but let me just outline it here for you. Four things, because I think they're they're probably similar things that come into our life. One is, 
In her affliction, she had no control over it. Something was happening in her life that she could not control. She couldn't change it. She can't give herself a baby. If she's going to have a baby, it's going to be because somehow the Lord reached down and said, have a baby. And so it was something she couldn't control. Sometimes in our own life, we go through times of suffering, times of affliction, or what have you, name it what you will, but I'm going through things that I have no control over. The second thing was it lasted a long time. Sometimes you go through situations in life that do last for years. You can look back and say, I have been struggling with this thing for two or three or five or ten years. And you have a chance to start thinking, I wonder if God even cares about me. Why is he withholding this baby? Every year we go back to the, to the sacrifice. Every year we get into this fight, this rivalry. Every year I'm weeping, I'm crying, I can't eat. The third thing was it affected her in every part of her being. Think about this. It affected her emotionally. She's crying. It affected her physically. She stopped eating. It affected her spiritually. He said, why are you downhearted? This is talking about the innermost part of this woman was just downcast. And I'm telling you, if you've experienced something like this, you know exactly what we're talking about here. Every part of your being begins to be affected. Emotionally, spiritually, physically. Because of this trial, this suffering, this affliction that has come. And the fourth thing was, she could find no help from any human. And sometimes when we're in those situations, we start looking, calling, emailing, texting, go on Facebook. Is there somebody out there who can help me? Is there somebody who can give me a word of advice? Is there anybody? Well, why are you crying, Hannah? Ain't I better to you than ten sons? And we get this kind of advice, and we think, is there anybody out there, anybody who understands, who can hear me, who can empathize with me, who can give me a word of counsel or advice or wisdom, something to help me overcome this pain, this sorrow I'm going through. Have you ever been there? Well, what are you going to do? That's a very, I'll call it a, a change point in your life. There's, there's two roads you can take, two paths that you can take here. You can take a path that says, I guess God doesn't care about me. I'm just going to go my own way and do my own thing. Or you can do what Hannah did. And she made a decision at this point to turn to the Lord. And I believe that that was the change point for her. So let's talk in the next verses about this turning point. Once they had finished eating, I'm in, I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. I, I like those words because it, it's like the idea that I'm going to do something here. I'm tired of the things, the way they are. I'm going to stand up. And so she got up, and the Bible says, Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And so Hannah is coming over to the doorpost of the Lord's house. I mean, she could not go in, but she was as close as she could get to the Lord. And she stands there beside Eli the priest. And the Bible says, in her deep anguish, I mean, we're talking about something that was deep inside this woman. It's something that's lasted for years. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord. Weeping bitterly. What does that tell you? I see like an Oreo cookie here when I read this. The, the cr what do you do when you have the Oreo cookie? What do you eat first? The cream. Twist it and lick the cream, right? Some of you might not do that. Some of us do. <laughs> and so there's an Oreo cookie. On the one piece of cookie is deep anguish. The other piece of the cookie is weeping bitterly. In other words, she was 
in a desperate spot when she came and prayed. She didn't wait for her problems to go away and pray. She came while she was in the middle of her problems. I mean, she's praying while weeping bitterly. I'm coming to you, Lord, and I'm weeping, and I'm pouring out my heart, and I'm praying to you, even though there is deep anguish and bitterness in my soul. I'm coming, and I'm praying to the Lord. And the third thing it says she did is she made a vow. Hannah made a decision that day, and I believe it was a life-changing decision for her. Here was her vow. Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. Doesn't that seem like a strange prayer for a woman who wanted a baby more than anything? I mean, wouldn't you think she would be saying, Lord, give me a baby, and I'm going to shower that baby with love. I will never let him out of my sight. I will never let him out of my arms. I will protect him with everything within me. He will be so protected. I'm going to be the best mom ever. Just give me that baby. But see, that's not what she said, was it? She said, Lord, give me this baby, and I'm going to give him to you. Something happened, I believe, inside this woman's heart while she was praying. I think that she began to realize that what was more important to her was not that she would have a baby to fulfill her desire, but that she would have a son who would serve God. That her relationship with the Lord and his relationship with the Lord was more important than her personal fulfillment to have a baby to meet my need. Remember, she was living in a, in a, in a country in a time when it was very spiritually dead. This priest Eli was, would not even discipline his children. He's supposed to be the man of God. And this, his sons, who were the priests, were committing adultery with the women who were coming to sacrifice. It was a terrible, terrible time. And yet she's saying, Lord, give me a son. Give me a son, and I will give him to you all the days of his life. He will come and serve you here. Because she wanted a boy who would know the Lord. That became the most important thing to her, not meeting my need. And so it was a turning point in her life. And what happens is it says, no razor will ever be used on his head. This is just talking about the, the, the being a Nazarite, just being set apart for the Lord. In verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Because Hannah was praying in her heart, her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So get the picture here. She's over here, Eli's right here, she's here, and she's praying in her heart, out of her deep anguish, weeping, but she's silent, but her lips are moving. She's going, but nonetheless, she's pouring out her heart to the Lord. Eli, being the spiritual, astute, and observant person he was, the priest at the time, said, Eli thought she was drunk. He said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Now, how many of you know that's not what you say to a woman who is pouring out her soul to the Lord, saying, Lord, give me a baby and I will give him to you. How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. When I read that, I, I, I picture in my mind that something is just pent up inside of me. I just need to pour it out. I need to lay it out there before the Lord. All the anguish, all the pain, all the hurt, all the sorrow, all the affliction, all these things that I've carried around in my heart for years. I need to come and pour it out to you, Lord. I want to Empty this out before you. And so she was pouring out her soul 
to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. So the three things you want to learn from these scriptures is Hannah stood up. She made a decision not to reject God, not to run away in sorrow, not to carry this pain for the rest of her life and hate her husband and hate her rival and hate life. She made a decision, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to go pray and I'm going to pour my heart out to the Lord and ask Him to do something here. I need you in my life, Lord Jesus. There's nobody around here who's going to help me get through this situation. And I believe with all my heart that there are times that God will take us through circumstances just to get our attention. He wants us to be focused on Him more than anything in life. And if it takes... If it takes things like this to to bring us to the place where I need you, Lord, more than anything. I don't need a baby in my life. I need you. I don't need what I think I need. I need you. Whatever the Lord can do to bring us to that place, I say praise God for that. And you go through sorrow and suffering and pain and hurt sometimes to get there. And we have a room full of testimonies like that, for sure. Hannah prayed to the Lord, and Hannah made this vow. Those are three things that took place on that day, and I believe it changed her life. Look at the the next portion of Scripture, verse 17. The answered prayer. Eli, again, the spiritually not astute person, but the priest, nonetheless, he stood and said to her, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, well, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something. What was happening before this? She was not eating. Now she's eating. Something's changing here. Her face was no longer downcast. What was happening before this? Her face was downcast. She was downhearted in her heart. Her spirit was depressed. Now her face is no longer downcast. Something was said to her, an answer in her prayer He just simply said, may the Lord grant you what you have asked. He didn't even know what she was praying for. He thought she was drunk. But may the Lord give you what you have asked. And she somehow took from that and received faith. Something is going to change here. And the Bible says that she began to be lighthearted. Her face was lifted. She began to eat again. And speaking about spiritual, what happened the next day? It says... Early the next morning in verse 19, they arose and they worshiped before the Lord. Isn't that amazing? And then they went back to their home at Ramah, and Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah. Yes, that's in the Bible. He made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. Now, it doesn't mean the Lord forgot her. The Lord doesn't forget, but he showed his face toward her. He granted her this baby. Why? Why? Because her heart was right. Her perspective was now right. I'm having a child from the Lord, and I'm going to give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And the Lord granted her this baby. But it's because something in her changed. Something in this woman changed that day. The Lord remembered her, and so in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant, and she gave birth to his son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The word Samuel means heard of God, heard, heard of God. Every time she looked at that little boy and said, come here, Samuel, she's reminding herself, I have this baby because God heard me, heard from God. Come here, heard from God. I want to hold you, heard from God. I love you, heard from God. And every time she talked to this boy, She's reminded of God listening and God hearing and God granting this baby. So what happens now? 
You ever been in a situation in your life where you made a foolish vow? He said, if, and people do this all the time, if, Lord, if you'll save me from this situation, I'll go to church the rest of my life. <laughs> and then the Lord saves you, and you never see him again. You know? <laughs> so we make these kinds of vows in a moment of desperation. And Hannah made a vow on that day, Lord, if you give me this son, I'm giving him back to you. And she kept her word. She kept her promise. Before I get into that, let me share with you these three things from the the verses I just read. How do you know when you've left your burden with the Lord? You ever ever hear people say this, give it to the Lord. Oh, just give it to the Lord. And you wonder, what in the world does that mean? How do I give it to the Lord? I can't even hold it. Give it to the Lord. Lift it up to the Lord. And you're, you're like, okay. I'm lifting. What do I do? How do I, how do I give this to you, Lord? I want to lift it up. And we, we try to figure this out. But I think this story is a great example of how you give it to the Lord. And that is that she prayed until something changed. See, she was not eating, and she prayed. And the first thing that happened was Eli said, go in peace. Peace came. Peace came to her heart. Peace came. It was anxiety and frustration and all those other emotions that came with the rivalry, but now peace. And before she wasn't eating, now I'm ready to eat. And before she was downcast, she says, I'm going to worship God. And before her face was downcast, now her face is lifted up. See, things were changing. That's how you know it's no longer my burden. I bring it to the Lord and I say, Lord, please take this from me. And I get up from a prayer and I walk away and I still carry it. My face is still downcast. I'm still in anxiety. The peace is not there. I still have the frustration. So I'm saying, why don't we, when we come to these places where we need to leave something with him, pray until something changes in me. Do your work in me, Lord that something will change. The Bible tells us that if we will pray and and turn our, our prayers to the Lord, our anxiety to the Lord, that He will give us His peace. It's in the book of Philippians. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will rule your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Are you familiar with that scripture? James, the fifth chapter says, is if anybody is in trouble, what do you do? Anybody know what it says there? Pray. If anybody's in trouble, pray. So the Lord is telling us what to do when we're in these situations. He says, come and pray, and pray, and leave the anxiety with me. Let the peace of God come into your life. And so, just like Hannah, I believe that we need to pour out our souls in prayer when we're going through these difficult times and really allow the Lord to bring about the change in our hearts. So finally, in verse 21, Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice. So we're talking now, it's a year later. It's time for the annual sacrifice to come. And Elkanah is going up to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And this lady is committed to her vow, isn't she? She said, listen, I'm going to keep him here with me till he's weaned. I don't know what that age is, if it's three, four, I don't know. But he was a very young child when she took him up there. But she said, I'm going to keep him with me, and when he's weaned, when he doesn't need me anymore, I'm going to come and I'm going to drop him off here. Now, how many of you moms remember dropping your child off for first grade or kinder, or whatever, the, whatever that first day, maybe it was staying at a friend's house overnight. It's the first day you're going to experience separation from my baby. But you know, even though you feel fearful and wonder what's going to happen, will they be safe, you know, can I put a webcam up here somewhere to keep an eye? 
but you know I'm going to see that baby again in a couple hours. But when Hannah walked over to Jerusalem for that next, or up to Shiloh after he was weaned, it was over. I'm giving him to the Lord, a young baby, young boy, giving him to serve God for the rest of his life. She's backed away. It is in the hands of the Lord at this point. She would come every year and give him a new linen ephod, like a robe, and she would make it a little bigger every year. Here's his three-year-old one. Here's his four-year-old one. He's got a five-year-old. Look how tall he's getting this year. And over the years, that was her impartation into his life that she gave this child to the Lord. Elkanah said to her, do what seems best to you. Wait until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. And so the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah flower, a skin of wine, and she brought him into the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. The child was young. This wasn't like a teenager. You're saying, I'd be glad to get him out of my house. This was a young child. They slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli, the not-so-insightful spiritual priest. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me the petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. What was God after here? Remember we read that it said God closed her womb? What was it that the Lord was wanting? Why, why did he close her womb and then all of a sudden open her womb? I believe that God had a plan. He has a plan. He had a plan for Israel. We were living in a time when there was such spiritual depression. But God had a plan for his people. He didn't want to leave them in this condition. And there was coming a day when the people would rebel against God's leadership and they would say, give us a king. We want to be like all the other nations. And they gave him Saul, and Saul turned out to be a bad king. But then there came another king, and his name was David. And he was the greatest king Israel ever had. His, his reign is called the Golden Years, King David. And David actually became the royal lineage that ultimately ended up being for the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know why or how David became the king of Israel? It's because this little boy, Samuel, learned to hear God's voice. His mom... Who knows if this child would have come a year earlier? If she would have had possession of him like every other child. But at the time that this thing changed in her heart, she said, if you give me this child, I'll give him to you. And we're going to read in these next few, next few chapters that this little boy started hearing God's voice. He was asleep laying down at night, and he would hear a voice, and he would think it was Eli, and he'd run in and say, Eli, what do you want? And he said, I didn't call you. And then he heard it again, and he said, what do you want? And Eli said, it wasn't me, and he heard it again. And Eli said, it's not me. And Eli realized God is speaking to him. And he said to Samuel, next time you hear that voice, say, here am I, Lord. And we start seeing a story of this boy who was given to the Lord, who would serve God, who would worship God in that, in that place at Shiloh, was growing up and learning to hear God's voice. And he became a prophet. 
And the Bible says, the Lord let none of his words fall to the ground. And one day, after Saul had rebelled, the Lord said to him, this boy, go to the house of Jesse, because my next king is there. And this little boy, he's now a grown man, but he's learned to hear from God. He goes over to the house of Jesse, and he walks in. And you want to understand here that the the destiny of the children of Israel was now in the hands of this man. Their future direction is in the hands of Samuel. But I believe he was so well positioned because his mom gave him to the Lord. That's why the Lord withheld that baby. Until something changed in her where she said, this is your child, Lord. And on that day, Samuel comes in, and like most of us, he uses his own reasoning, and he says, look at this boy, this first son. Look how big he is. Look how tall he is. This must be the Lord's anointed. And the Lord spoke to him and said, this is not the one. Well, who's the next one? The Lord said, this is not the one. See, he's hearing. He's hearing God. This little boy who was given to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord, learning to hear God's voice, God is using him to set the the future of Israel. He comes to the next one. No, it's not him. And he comes to the next one. It's not him. All through these, I think it was seven sons, I can't remember the number now, of, of Jesse that were there, each one of them, no, 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 no. And then finally, Uh, Samuel says, is there anybody else? I know the Lord sent me here. Is there any other children? Well, yeah, there's this other kid. He's out there. You know, he's just like the troublemaker, whatever, the ruddy one. We left him out there taking care of the sheep because we knew for sure God wasn't going to call him. Let me see him. I'm not going to leave until I see him. And in walks David, and he heard God. This is the one. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful event that God's purpose was established in making David the king of Israel because of this boy. So all the sorrow, to me, is worth it. All those years of the pain and the the rivalry and all that that took place because it ultimately moved this woman, Hannah, to the place of committing her child to the Lord. And so I can see big picture, all things working together for good to those who love God. Isn't that a beautiful story? I'll close with these. In Psalm 119, 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now I obey your word. Isn't that a great scripture? I don't want to be afflicted. How many here are praying for affliction? No, but before I was afflicted, I went astray but now I'm obeying you. Something happened in affliction that moved me. It moved the direction of my life. And if affliction can produce this, praise God. Psalm 119, 71, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. I've never had anybody share that in a testimony. It was good for me to be afflicted. But when you can look at this story And even the stories of your own life, I think you can honestly say, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Psalm 119, 75, I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Isn't that a beautiful thought? In your faithfulness, you have afflicted me. Why? Because God is faithful to do his work in us. He's faithful to work in us that which is pleasing unto his sight. And if it takes affliction... He is a faithful God who knows what it needs to move us there. And then finally, Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So would you stand with me? We're going to close in prayer. Maybe somebody could come down here and play the piano so it sounds spiritual. Is there anybody can do that? Is there a piano player here? How about a guitar? Can you make the guitar sound spiritual? Okay.
just some background music. So we want to make time for prayer. I just have these four areas maybe you need prayer for today. Are you suffering affliction now? Are you at a turning point in your life, a place where you're deciding, you know what, I'm so tired of this affliction. I'm ready to run. I'm ready to turn my back on the Lord. I would say to you, don't do it. You're at a point now where the Lord could come through in your situation. If you're at a turning point, turn to Him. Maybe God's just simply calling you to pray, like Hannah. Go pray. Stand up and pray. And pray. Pour out your soul until something changes. What if it takes a year? This took year after year. It doesn't matter how long it takes if God's purpose gets built into your life. God is able to work all things for good in you. And finally, maybe you just need to trust God that He will bring good out of your situation. If you've lost confidence in that, today is your day to say, Lord, I need to have a renewing of my faith to know that you are able to work everything for good in my life. And so let's pray for that collectively. If you need individual prayer, please feel free to come up afterwards. People will be glad to pray with you. If you have a need for a prayer for healing, there will be people here to pray for healing.